I'm Tony Zeiss. I'm the director of the museum. What a wonderful privilege it is to be in this terrific building, and we hope you'll come to think of this very soon as your museum because it's the community's museum. In fact, it's the world's museum. We are going to be live on uh, C-SPAN tonight. Thank you so much, fellas, for what you're doing. We appreciate that. We're very excited to uh, welcome you to the museum. You'll have to come back. It takes several days to go through it. It's quite an exciting place. Um, we're delighted to have you back to our second uh, series. Some of you came to the first one, uh, and this is the second one, the first one in January. And the topic tonight is Biblical Influences on Religious Freedom. 232 years ago today, the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom was adopted and later served as a model for the First Amendment. Tonight, we have a group of talented scholars who will discuss our biblical influences on religious freedom. I now would like to introduce you to our moderator for tonight's program. His name is Dr. Byron Johnson. He'll introduce the speakers and moderate. He's the Distinguished Professor of the Social Sciences at Baylor University. He's the founding director of the Baylor Institute for Studies of Religion, as well as a director of the program on pro-social behavior. He's a leading authority on the scientific study of religion, the efficacy of faith-based organizations, and criminal justice. Johnson's recent publications have examined the impact of faith-based programs on recidivism reduction and prisoner reentry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Byron Johnson. Good evening. The Museum of the Bible has many wonderful exhibits that I hope you all will get a chance to see. Many of these exhibits are historical, some are contemporary, and the, I have to say they're truly amazing. Well, lectures and symposia like the one that we're going to see tonight are going to be quite common here at the museum, and what we're going to find out is the many consequential ways in which the Bible is important to American society. Tonight, we're going to be t uh, looking at the connection between the Bible and religious freedom. You know, the founders of our nation and the forebears came to this land to begin an unusual experiment. And it had to do with a lot of things, including religious freedom. One of the most iconic symbols of that religious freedom is the Liberty Bell. And some of you may have had a chance to see a replica of it on the second floor. The Liberty Bell was ordered on November the 1st, 1751, as a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of William Penn's charter. And when you tour and you see the replica, the replica was made in 2001 at the same foundry, the Whitechapel foundry in England, and engraved on the Liberty Bell. It's just one example of the connection between the Bible and religious freedom is a passage that comes from Leviticus 25.10, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. We're really fortunate tonight to have three really wonderful scholars that are going to be talking about this topic from different perspectives. I've had the great fortune of knowing all of them, and so I know what a treat you're in for. They're each going to be speaking for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. And I'm not very technologically sophisticated, so I have an iPad up here where I will be fielding questions from Facebook. Let's hope I don't botch that up. And, um, but let me first start off by introducing our first speaker, Tim Shaw, who is a dear friend and a research professor of government at Baylor. He's a senior advisor and director of the South and Southeast Asia Action, Action Team with the Religious Freedom Institute based here in Washington. He's also the Director of International Research at the Religious Freedom Research Project at Georgetown University, the Berkeley Center. He's written on so many different publications, but here are some of the more recent books that are germane to our topic tonight. God's Century, Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. Then a two-volume set, Christianity and Freedom, Historical Perspectives, Christianity and Freedom, Contemporary Perspectives, both with Cambridge Press, just brand new uh, volumes. And then Religious Freedom and Gay Rights, Emerging Conflicts in the U.S. and Europe. The name of his topic, or title tonight is address, No Genesis, No Jefferson, I love it, The Real Roots of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Join me in welcoming Tim Shaw. Good evening and happy Religious Freedom Day. <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know how many of you knew when you woke up this morning that it was Religious Freedom Day. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of attention, doesn't get the attention that it deserves, uh, but religious freedom is such a crucial, important principle. It certainly deserves its own day uh, and des deserves its own conversation uh, here this evening. Uh, congratulations to the Museum of the Bible. Congratulations to the Institute for Studies of Religion for hosting this important conversation about uh, religious freedom. Religious freedom is uh, of enormous importance. Uh, we know that it was of enormous importance uh, to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the reason that it's Religious Freedom Day uh, is because it was on this day in 1786 that the Virginia Assembly finally enacted uh, what became known as the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Uh, and that statute was authored by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he first wrote the text of the bill uh, around 1777, uh, which means he wrote it around the same time as, of course, he famously drafted the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and uh, then uh, he kept uh, trying to get it through the Virginia uh, Assembly over many years. It was introduced formally in 1779, but it was not passed uh, until 1786, uh, a number of years later. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was enormously proud of the statute for religious freedom. If you uh, visit uh, his epitaph uh, in Monticello, Virginia, uh, you will notice that there are three items on his epitaph. Uh, one is that he was author of the Declaration of Independence. Another uh, was that he was the founder of the University of Virginia. And the third uh, is that he was the author of the Act concerning religious freedom. Uh, he does not include <laughs> that he was president of the United States uh, or ambassador to France uh, or any of the other uh, enormously important things uh, that he was. He uh, was most proud among uh, two or three other accomplishments of the fact that he was the author of the Act for Religious Freedom. And we know too that he was so proud of his authorship of the Act for Religious Freedom that when he was ambassador to France, uh, a position in which he was serving when the statute was finally passed in 1786, he immediately arranged uh, for the text of the statute to be printed, published, and distributed uh, in France uh, and elsewhere uh, in Europe. And he was enormously gratified uh, that the high culture, uh, the salons of Paris uh, were impressed uh, and moved uh, and, uh, and inspired by the example that the state of Virginia uh, had set for the world. And it truly is something uh, for which Thomas Jefferson should have been proud. Let's just think about how different our country would be if we did not have freedom of religion. Uh, for all people, regardless of their convictions of conscience, regardless of their religious beliefs, I know for one that my own life would be different. My father uh, left India in 1965, uh, more than 50 years ago. Uh, he uh, was of Jain background, uh, an adherent of Jainism, a very small religious sect in India. Uh, when he made the long journey from Bombay, India to Madison, Wisconsin, uh, he was worried about many things. <laughs> he was worried about what the weather was going to be like in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he was worried about who would meet him uh, when he got off the Greyhound bus uh, in the middle of Madison, Wisconsin in the, in the summer of 1965. But there was one thing he did not have to worry about. He did not have to worry about whether he was coming to a country uh, that would uh, not welcome him or be unable to welcome him because of his religion. Uh, he was able to make a home here. Uh, able to raise a family here uh, because of what Thomas Jefferson did in the late 1770s uh, and 1780s. Uh, so let's remember what the consequences are uh, of what Thomas Jefferson accomplished. That's what we're here to talk about today. So we have this extraordinary statute uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson, and, and to, to put the statute in context and particularly to understand the background and ultimately, as I want to argue today, the biblical uh, uh, seedbed from which the statute emerged, I want to talk about just seven words of Jefferson's statute. Uh, 
And to help us understand those seven words of Jefferson's statute and the whole meaning of the statute, I'm then going to talk about a number of Latin words, since you all know Latin, I assume. If you don't, you better, you better leave now. Uh, uh, but no, I'm, I'm going to help you out. Uh, to understand some of the, the background, the theological underpinning or philosophical underpinning of the uh, seven crucial words of the statute for religious freedom. I'm going to talk about 18 Latin words. And then to help you understand those Latin words, I'm going to uh, talk about some Hebrew words. Uh, and I'm going to talk about 13 Hebrew words, which in fact I think provide the real bedrock of Jefferson's uh, ideas that became so foundational for our own country. And the, the, the words, uh, the seven words of the statute for religious freedom, again, passed on January 16, 1786, are the very first words of the statute for religious freedom. And they are, Almighty God hath created the mind free. Almighty God hath created the mind free. And when one reads those words, the very first words of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, one is reminded, of course, of uh, some important words uh, from the Declaration of Independence, uh, which uh, Jefferson had written in 1776, of course, uh, a year before he began drafting the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. We're reminded of the great words of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Immediately, we're confronted, when we look at the text of the Virginia statute, with a claim about our human nature, that human beings, all human beings, are irreducibly, inalienably made and structured in a certain kind of way. Uh, and above all, what Thomas Jefferson underlines at the very beginning of the statute is that human beings, the, the mind of human beings, was made to be free. Now, it's important to understand what Jefferson is doing in the historical and intellectual context of the time. Thomas Jefferson was not the only person arguing for religious freedom uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. There were many arguments for religious freedom, and you could say there was a growing number of arguments for religious freedom uh, in this context. And we know, of course, that Thomas Jefferson was a man of the Enlightenment. Uh, we know that he was deeply influenced by European uh, thinkers such as Condorcet and uh, Rousseau and Locke uh, and Helvetius uh, and Edward Gibbon, uh, influenced by the Scottish Enlightenment as well as the uh, 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 European Continental Enlightenment, in influenced by the French Enlightenment, influenced by the English Enlightenment. And these strands of thought introduced and uh, uh, advocated, put forward many different kinds of arguments for religious freedom. And there were three arguments that I think were very, very increasingly common uh, in this period of European history. One was a, uh, uh, an anti-clerical argument, frankly. Uh, and uh, Jefferson in his time in France would have been very familiar uh, with this, this anti-clerical strand. There were many people arguing for freedom of religion as a way to break the power of, of, of the church uh, and of religion. Uh, which they distrusted on secularist grounds. Another uh, very frequent argument uh, was a, a Christian theological argument that rooted religious freedom in Christian doctrine, uh, that made the case that only religious freedom was consistent with the spirit of charity and, and peaceableness uh, of the Christian religion. Ta uh, John Locke begins his letter concerning toleration uh, by arguing that uh, he submits that toleration he believes, is the chief characteristic mark of the true church. So that's a kind of Christian uh, doctrinal argument. Uh, and then there was another very common argument, especially in a Europe that had struggled with the wars of religion for a very long period of time. And that argument uh, was that the only way to solve Europe's consistent uh, uh, chronic divisions uh, and, and warfare over religion was to introduce religious freedom, uh, to simply uh, allow people to believe uh, whatever they wanted. Now, Thomas Jefferson in the Statute for Religious Freedom does not make any of those arguments central. What he does instead is argue that religious freedom is an irreducible, non-negotiable demand of our human nature, period. He doesn't argue for religious freedom on grounds of expediency. 
he doesn't argue for religious freedom on the ground uh, that it's going to lead to outcomes that he likes. Uh, he doesn't introduce an, a results-oriented argument for religious freedom. He introduces, to use a fancy philosophical term, a deontological argument for religious freedom, an argument that says this is simply rooted in the principles of human nature. Human nature itself is such that it demands always and everywhere that the conscience and reason and freedom of human beings should be respected in matters of religion. And it's quite striking that he doesn't, to support these kinds of arguments, refer to secular philosophers or thinkers like Hobbes or Grotius or thinkers that were very influential and, and important in this, uh, in this period. In fact, what's striking uh, is, and I, here I'm gonna talk about my 18 Latin words, uh, is that the one thinker that Thomas Jefferson cites when he's making an elaborate argument for religious freedom, and this is in another work called The Notes in the State of Virginia, the one thinker that he refers to uh, when he's elaborating this argument that human uh, nature itself requires religious freedom is an early church father by the name of Tertullian. Uh, I discovered this when I was teaching a class at Georgetown, and I think one of my students, Javier Pena, is in the audience, who actually was uh, inflicted with my uh, class on this uh, subject. As I was teaching this class on the history of religious freedom, I discovered that Jefferson uh, had cited this early church father, Tertullian. Uh, and the phrase that he cites, uh, he, he quotes it in Latin, but I'll give you the English translation, it's a fundamental human right, a privilege of nature, that every man should worship according to his own convictions. One man's religion neither harms nor helps another man. It is assuredly no part of religion to compel religion to which free will and not force should lead us. Those words the church father Tertullian had written not in the 17th century or the 16th century, but in the early third century. Uh, and Tertullian wrote those 18 Latin words because he was inspired by 13 Hebrew words. Uh, it was because of his reflection on those words that he came to believe Tertullian that it was an essential inherent part of the way we were created by God that we would be free. And of course the 13 Hebrew words I'm referring to are the words of Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. And created and God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them male and female. He created them. God created us in a, in a sense to have the very kind of freedom that he himself has. Uh, that's what it means to be created in the image of God. We partake of something of the liberty and indeed Tertullian says of the dignity of God. We have a godlike freedom and dignity and we know that ultimately from uh, what we learn from uh, inspecting and observing uh, the magnificent dignity of other human beings but it's also something we uh, we see taught uh, in those 13 Hebrew words uh, in Genesis, which I believe are the real soil from which ideas of religious freedom uh, grew uh, up from uh, over the centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Great job. Next is Robert Louis Wilkin, who is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of the History of Christianity Emeritus at the University of Virginia. He's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's the past president of the American Academy of Religion, past president of the North American Patristic Society, as well as the, Acad the Academy of Catholic Theology. He's the chairman of the board of the Institute of Religion and Public Life, which is the publisher of an outstanding publication that a lot of us read called First Things. Among his many books are these three influential books, The First Thousand Years, A Global History of Christianity, the spirit of early Christian thought, seeking the face of God, and the Christians as the Romans saw them, and then remembering the Christian past. He's taught at Fordham, Notre Dame, the Institutum Patristicum in Rome, the Gregorian University in Rome, and Providence College. It's a real pleasure to have Robert Louis Wilkins speaking on the Christian origin of religious freedom. Thank you very much. Customary to say uh, how pleased one is to be here. So people said to me, how far did you come? 
And I said, well, it happens that I live just down the street <laughs> at 1317 4th Street. And my wife uh, drove me over here this afternoon, and then <laughs> she came and is going to drive me home. She said, it's 0.8 miles. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to have uh, um, the beginning of a relationship to this, this fine new museum. Now, those of you who, who have been through the museum know that there is an exhibit on the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening was a uh, powerful period of religious renewal in the United States. The great preacher, George Whitfield, uh, was the spearhead for this awakening. And the Great Awakening spread all through the country kind of a, to, to bring an inner conversion of people. And when it finally, it, it started further north, it got to central Virginia. Virginia, in the 1770s, was an Anglican colony. The official established church was the Anglican church. And all of a sudden, these Baptist ministers started seeping into Virginia and drawing people away from the Anglican parishes. And they were not happy about that. And they had English law at the time to uh, enforce. And you couldn't just go out and preach. You, you had to be licensed by Anglican state authorities. Well, it happened that one of the largest revivals and meetings happened near the town of Orange, Virginia, Virginia, which is where James Madison lived. And so James Madison knew about what was happening, and some of the people that he knew were at the time in jail in Culpeper, which is just right up the road. So he had a firsthand knowledge of the harassment of these Baptist clergy and their followers. He was only in his early 20s at the time, and he had begun to get interested in politics, as his father was. And he was elected to a committee to prepare a Declaration of Rights, what uh, my friend here, Tim, jo uh, Tim Shaw, has been talking about. The original draft was written by George Mason, contemporary of um, uh, Madison and Jefferson. And the language is very significant. He said that all men should enjoy the fullest toleration, toleration in the exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. The fullest toleration in the exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. Madison, he was only 24 years old, thought that was not adequate because toleration is a form of indulgence that the ruling authorities grant people who they don't like. And so he suggested a revision to read, all men are equally entitled to the full and the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. And the key phrase there, entitled to the full and the free exercise of religion. In other words, he's implying that it is a right, not something that a benevolent ruler grants. But some, and the leader on the opposition, was Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry pushed for a modified establishment of religion where others besides the Anglicans would receive funds for their schools and other institutions. And Madison wanted this to be voted down. And he wrote then a document which is called the Memorial and Remonstrance Against Religious Assessment. And this is what he wrote. Because we hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion is the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it 
It can only be directed by reason and by conviction, not by force or violence. He's reflecting what um, Tim Shaw just said, that religion, because it is an inner conviction of the heart and mind, you can't compel a person to believe something by using some external means, a sword or a whip or something more violent. And then he says, the religion of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as his conviction and his conscience may dictate. This right is an inalienable right, and what he means by that is it's because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of others, that you should be able to choose what you believe. It is inalienable also because what is here a right towards men is a duty toward God. It is the duty of every man to render to the creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to God. And then he says, this duty is precedent. We don't use the phrase in that way. It precedes both in order and time and in degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. So what you believe takes precedent in time and in logic to what civil society requires. Before any man can be considered as a member of civil society, he must be considered as a subject of the governor of the universe. And if a member of civil society do it with the saving of his own allegiance to the universal sovereign, we maintain, therefore, that in matters of religion, no man's right is abridged by the institution of civil society. That is, the right to confess what you believe is one that precedes and cannot be in any way limited. And that religion, and this is a lovely phrase, is wholly exempt from its cognizance. Wish we spoke that way today. <laughs> Religion is wholly exempt from the co cognizance of the state. That term goes back, John Locke uses it, and also a great English theologian by the name of John Owen. Now, the memorial is a political document not a theological treatise, and Madison does not cite biblical texts. But those of you who have some familiarity with the Bible certainly can hear biblical overtones in what he's seeing. Even a cursory look at the way Ad Madison puts things, it's apparent that the central ideas, again, as Shaw has already shown, derive from Christianity and can be traced to the Bible as it had been understood by Christian thinkers in earlier centuries. For example, Madison says, religion is a duty we owe to our creator, the great commandment of Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Or Luke, thou shalt worship the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. Religion is a duty we owe to our creator. Second, he says that the business of government and that of religion must be kept separate. We maintain that in matters of religion, no man's right is abridged by the institution of civil society. And again, this nice phrase, religion is wholly exempt from its cognizance. Government has no knowledge of what religious people do. Ultimately, this distinction between the realm of religion and that of the state goes back to the words of Jesus. Render unto God the things that are of God, and to Caesar the things that are of Caesar. And over the course of the 16 and 1700 years before it gets to the time of Madison and Jefferson, that text had been interpreted and interpreted and interpreted to mean that the world basically is governed by 
two, there are two realms in which people live. One from the state, civil, and one. To give a good example here, the great reformer, John Calvin. One realm, he said, is spiritual, whereby the conscience is instructed in piety and in reverencing God. The second is political, where man is educated for the duties of humanity and citizenship. It's to do with our worldly goods, safety, security, what the government is expected to provide. When the one is considered, we should call off our minds and not allow the other to be part of the discussion. The civil society should have no cognizance of religion. So ultimately, that language in Madison's Declaration goes back to the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Third, he gives conscience a prominent place. Um, he says that religion must be left up to the conscience and conviction of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as his conscience may dictate. Conscience, then, is understood as a natural capa capacity in everyone to discern, design truth and how one is to live. Now, the term conscience was used by philosophers in the Roman world, in the Greek world, but it enters the vocabulary of Western society through Christianity, particularly through the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans and in 1 Corinthians. Apostle Paul writes, in your actions, let your conscience be your guide as to what you should do. For a person's liberty should not be determined by another man's conscience, that is, another man's judgment as to what one is to believe or what is right or wrong. So conscience, and the, as in all of these issues, had a long history of being used and applied in different situations in the course of medieval Christianity and right through the Reformation. In fact, um, some of the reading that I've been doing, the first time that the term conscience occurs during the Reformation is on the lips of a Franciscan nun who says, because she was, her monastery was being shut down by the Lutheran magistrates. She says, you talk about the freedom of the gospel and you won't allow us to follow our consciences. So Madison stands in that tradition, though he's not citing that text. Finally, very quickly, Madison says the right to practice the religion of one's choice is inalienable. That is, it precedes the claims of society. Ultimately, this goes back to the biblical idea that human beings are created in the image of God, which Shaw has already said. And what that means is they are free. They are free by nature. Freedom is not something that civil society grants. They're able to make their own judgments about what to believe and what not to believe, and they cannot be subject to the dictates of others. So to summarize, Madison was the beneficiary of ways of thinking developed by earlier Christian thinkers. And it is that tradition, that Christian tradition, that is the foundation of our American understanding of religious freedom. This tradition extended over centuries, and in some cases can be traced back to Christian writers of the second and third century, like Tertullian who Shaw has already mentioned. But the ultimate source is the Bible. James Madison's views on religious freedom were not the result of his reading of the Bible. It's not the way things work. He was not a theologian. He wasn't a religious philosopher. Nonetheless, it is evident he is adapting ideas developed by Christian thinkers on the basis of the scriptures. In that sense, the Bible had an influence 
on Madison's conception of religious freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Our last speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Rivers, is currently a lecturer at Harvard University. She's the executive director and senior fellow for social policy, for social science and policy at the Seymour Institute for Black Church uh, and Policy Studies. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Institute for Studies of Religion at Baylor. Recent projects have focused on launching the Black Church Commission on Bioethics, Human Life, and Marriage, and an international symposium on marriage and the family hosted by the Vatican. She holds a PhD from Harvard University where she was a doctoral fellow in the multidisciplinary program in inequality and social policy at the Kennedy School and a graduate research fellow of the National Science Foundation. She's presented at many universities across the country. Her latest publication appears in the, vol the volume, Not Just Good, But Beautiful, and in uh, the book, The Cultural Matrix by Harvard Press. You're in for a real treat as Jackie comes to share this paper, The Black Church Enacting the Biblical Mandate for Religious Freedom. Dr. Jackie Rivers. Good evening. I'm truly honored to be here with you, and I'm absolutely wowed by the museum. Uh, my congratulations go to those who have put it together, and it's wonderful to have something like this right here in the heart of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And uh, Professor Wilkins talked about having walked up the street, or 0.8 miles, I flew from Jamaica. <laughs> so <laughs> I am very glad to be here with you tonight. I do want to take a little bit of a different tack, though, in talking about religious freedom and the connection, its biblical roots. In the two excellent presentations we've heard, there's really been a focus on something which is fundamental and which I agree with wholeheartedly, which is it's an inalienable, inalienable right, that it is intrinsic to being human that we have the right to follow our conscience and out of that, closely related to that, fundamental to that, the right for religious freedom. But from the perspective of the black church, it's really about what has happened over the course of history. And in fact, if you think about it, God doesn't just declare that we have religious freedom. He demonstrates it. And it starts with the story of Exodus. Think about it. Moses goes to meet with Pharaoh. And what does he do? He says, God has commanded us to leave and to go to a place to worship him. And when Pharaoh refuses to allow them to go, he's not merely disobeying God. He's abrogating their right to religious freedom. He's denying them the right to religious freedom. Because religious freedom is about the right to follow God. And it's not just about the right to freedom of worship that we can in our churches and in our bedrooms and in our homes worship. It's about the right to act in response to our understanding of God's calling on our lives. It's about the right to do it not just in private, but also to do it in public. So God starts with an action that demonstrates the importance, the power of religious freedom. And for the black church, that is a central motif that runs throughout our history, the idea of the exodus. Because for us, the Civil War was an exodus. It was a crossing over from slavery to freedom. It was an act of judgment by God. And it's rooted really in the understanding of biblical faith. Because those black and white abolitionists who worked to bring about that exodus, they were largely people of faith. People who believed the Bible and who lived it out. Sojourner Truth, an itinerant preacher, a woman who was an abolitionist herself, a former slave, who argued against slavery powerfully, who argued for the rights of women long before uh, our current focus on uh, equality 
came, uh, and all of this came out of her powerful faith, out of her understanding of the biblical meaning of what it was to follow God. The same is true of John Brown, who takes on Harper's Ferry. John Brown's actions are about his understanding of God's absolute judgment on the horror of slavery. Again, rooted in his exercise of his religious freedom and growing out of biblical faith. The same is true for Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman saw herself as on a mission guided and protected by God himself. Rooted in her biblical faith, she has the courage to go back into the South after escaping from slavery. She goes back into the South to free 300 other uh, enslaved people on 19 trips. The power of religious freedom being exercised and in action. But that's not the only exodus event in the history of the black church. Think about the civil rights movement. An exodus from disenfranchisement and terror in the southern United States into full citizenship. And in the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, there is nothing greater in the world than freedom. I would rather die in abject poverty with my convictions than live in inordinate riches with lack of self-respect. For him, religious freedom was expressed in all of the work of the civil rights movement. We were talking about this earlier today. The fact that the importance of King's faith in his role in the civil rights movement, the importance of the church, the black church, in the civil rights movement is fading from view, perhaps being uh, blotted out. And the focus is on Dr. King rather than on Reverend King. But this was a man driven by his faith, strengthened by his faith. He endured death threats, bombings of his home, endangering his wife and children based on the strength of his faith. See, early in the campaign, the, the bus boycott in Montgomery, King is terrified by the rising violence. And in the middle of the night, he's sitting in his kitchen trying to figure out, what do I do? And he has a revelation. He hears Jesus speaking to him and telling him that he must have faith and that he must stand up for righteousness and that he must do what is right. And as he hears this, it becomes a mantra that he goes back to time and time again when he faces crisis in pursuing the civil rights movement, he's strengthened by the memory of that experience. In fact, David Garrow, who as far as I know, is not a man of faith at all, writes a powerful biography of King, which doesn't come at it from a religious perspective. I mean, it's completely secular, but the theme keeps coming back even in, through the eyes of a secular writer, how important that revelation was to King's having the strength to do what he did. But King was not the only one. There was Reverend uh, Fred Shuttleworth, Ralph Abernathy, uh, Joseph Lowry, all of them, it was the black clergy, it was men of faith, acting on their religious freedom, exercising religious freedom, who led the civil rights movement. But let us not forget that without the tens of thousands of black church-going people, people of faith who took to the streets, those leaders could not have done anything. And the power of the church in this movement is indicated when King is involved in naming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was going to be called the Southern Leadership Conference. But King says, no, this has to be the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because he knows that black people are rooted in biblical faith. 
He knows that it is going to take those all-night prayer and praise and singing and preaching sessions in black churches the night before they hit the streets for them to have the strength to withstand police truncheons, police dogs, fire hoses, without retaliating with violence. The story of the civil rights movement, the victories of the civil rights movement, is the victories of the black church of religious freedom being exercised. And it's very appropriate that we talk about this tonight because just yesterday we celebrated Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's day. But even today, the exercise of religious freedom is so critical in the black community. Because, oh, I do want to say one other thing, and that is, I want you just to have a sense of how important this biblical interpretation is to King. Because he bases his passionate advocacy for the struggle for civil rights in a biblical understanding. And you see it in the I Have a Dream speech. He quotes Isaiah 40 in describing his vision for African Americans, his vision of the future. I have a dream that one day every valley will be exalted, every hill and mountain made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. So King is explicitly championing the responsibility of every Christian to follow his or her conscience and obey God's calling when any conflict arises between the two, between God's calling and the duty to civil society, which Professor Wilkins was talking about earlier, that religious freedom takes precedence. So in his uh, sermon titled Paul's Letter to American Christians, he says, Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this is an imaginary letter. He imagines Paul writing to American Christians, and Paul goes on to say in this imaginary letter, Or as I said to the Philippian Christians, you are a colony of heaven. This means that although you live in a colony of time, your ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. You have a dual citizenry. You live both in time and eternity, both in heaven and earth. Therefore, your ultimate allegiance is not to the government, not to the state, not to the nation, not to any man-made institution. The Christian owes his allegiance, ultimate allegiance to God. And if any earthly institution conflicts with God's will, it is your Christian duty to take a stand against it. This is a perfect expression of religious freedom, and it's grounded in his understanding of the biblical mandate. He also, this was reflected also in the final speech that King gives, his mountaintop oration, which is actually made the night before he's murdered. And he's talking about having been to the mountaintop and seen the promised land, but like Moses, he may not cross over with us. It's as though he knew what was going to happen the next day. He likens his journey to that of Moses, and the entire movement is in his eyes a minor exodus of the southern black person from terror and disenfranchisement to full citizenship. But more than that, King saw the whole strategy uh, the nonviolent strategy of the civil rights movement, this winning strategy, as consistent with biblical teaching. He said, violence creates many more social problems than it solves. And as I've said in so many instances, the Negro in particular and colored peoples all over the world in their struggle for freedom, if they succumb to the temptation of using violence for their struggle, Unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desperate night of bitterness. And the biblical source he's using is Matthew's words, Jesus' words in Matthew. In the fifth chapter of the gospel, as recorded by St. Matthew, we read these very arresting words flowing from the lips of our Lord and Master. You have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for those that despitefully use you, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. His entire strategy 
is seen as coming from the lips of Jesus as recorded in Matthew. So for the black church, religious freedom, yes, it's an inalienable right, but even more, it is exercised, it is freedom, it is our exodus. And so religious freedom and its biblical roots are essential to the faith of the black church. Okay, wow, that was a good session, I have to say. One of the best I've been a part of. And we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, and we're gonna start, these are Facebook questions that are, are coming in, and with technology, I'm, I'm, here, I'm seeing this. So Rhonda has a question for Dr. Rivers. Has the interpretation of what freedom of religion means changed over the last 300 years? And uh, others may answer that if you'd like to, but this one is specifically addressed to Dr. Rivers. So I don't feel that I have the historical chops to really take that on, but <laughs> I, think, I think what has been demonstrated by the three talks is in fact that there is a thread that runs right through and that is consistent. Does that mean it's never been interpreted differently? Mm -hmm. I think that that is clearly not the case. But starting from the biblical times, this notion that the right to respond to God's calling is uh, attains to every single person. Whether they choose, and, and, and this was something that I didn't get to because of time, whether they choose to acknowledge that calling by expression of faith, Christian faith, Muslim faith, Buddhist faith, Hindu faith, whether or not someone chooses faith, the right to respond is inalienable. And so if you are an atheist, you still have that right. You have the right, no one has a right to force you into an expression of faith if in your heart you respond to that calling by saying, no, God does not exist. Great. Okay, Karen has a question for Dr. Shaw. Did Jefferson apply his philosophy towards religion when writing the First Amendment? Well, uh, Jefferson, uh, uh, of course, did not write the First Amendment. Uh, the, the First Amendment was uh, drafted primarily by James Madison, but working with a committee. Uh, uh, so uh, Je Jefferson was in France at the time of the drafting of the uh, Bill of Rights, so did not play any direct role on, on that. But it, I think it's understood uh, that the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom played a major role in shaping the First Amendment, particularly the two first uh, uh, clauses of the First Amendment, namely the religion clauses, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, re respecting an establishment of religion, uh, nor abridging the free exercise thereof. I thought you did that very gracefully <laughs> without, without pushing back hard at all. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Wilkin from Wes. How does the idea of separation of church and state relate to freedom of religion? Can I first just speak you to the to question? Go back to the first one of the her, years. Um, the most profound change that has come about, you can hear from reading what we read from Jefferson and Madison, they assumed a world in which people believed in God. We now are living in a world in which many people do not believe in God and our public life has excluded God. So with each passing decade, it's going to be harder to make a case for religious freedom because it looks like special pleading. In fact, a man wrote a book a few years ago, um, why tolerate religion? What's so special about religion? And that's the profound challenge of our own time. Now back to the question to me. Yeah, was, so the question is, how does the idea of separation of church and state relate to freedom of religion? Well, the separation means that the religious communities have the right to determine how they are going to worship God and how they are going to live, practice. And that is something that the government has no say in. So unless you have 
the distinction. I mean, the whole struggle for the history of religious freedom was to get beyond the assumption that the king, the prince, the magistrates determined what people were as a community to believe. And, and there was a saying, a Latin saying um, in the 16th century, whoever is the king, the ruler, he is the one who determines what the religion should be. So the whole development of religious freedom was to break free of that assumption and to say that there are two realms and they, they inevitably interact, but one cannot determine the other, going both ways. Yeah. Great. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Rivers from Kristen. How would you encourage people to think, think through where they stand when religious and civil liberties seem to clash? I think that that is a very important question. And I think that what I like about this, the question is the acknowledgement that we have to balance those two. Mm. And so uh, I think the difficulty is how profound an infringement on religious the sense of conscience is being enforced. And are people prepared to pay the price? I mean, King exercised his religious freedom, but he believed that in doing so, you had to pay the price. And so I, then we need to look to the courts of the land to help us with that question of balancing, because everyone should have the right to live out their religious freedom. Some external arbiter needs to balance those rights, and then we, as each of us um, exercises our conscience, has to be prepared to pay the price, as King did, facing prison, willing, not being willing to pay bail in cases where he felt it was unjust. Great. This is a question that I think um, a number of you touched on in your, your presentations. It's addressed to Dr. Wilkin, but I think Dr. Shaw could answer it too. What are some of the earliest examples of freedom of religion around the world? Well, um, let's take the um, England because that's the case where um, so much of the influence on this country. In the 17th century, England went through a great struggle because the Puritans did not want to conform to what was the publicly acknowledged religion. And over the course of several generations, they were able to make a case. And basically, the English rulers decided with the act of toleration that there had to be space for those who were not um, Church of England people. So that would be one very clear example. Great. And it has repercussions um, there are others in, in the Netherlands, um, in France. Um, but the English example, I think, is for us is yeah. most important. Yeah. Just, yes, uh, Tim. Note one uh, early example, which is often forgotten in these kinds of discussions, and that is uh, we have a very early example in the Roman Empire at the beginning of the fourth century. Robert has written uh, expertly about this, uh, namely the so-called Edict of Milan, uh, which was co-authored by the co-emperors at the time, Constantine and Licinius, uh, in 313. Uh, it's sometimes misunderstood that all the so-called Edict of Milan did was grant toleration uh, to Christians. In fact, that had been done two years earlier uh, in 311 uh, through an Edict of Galerius. Uh, but the, the so-called Edict of Milan, it's so-called because it really wasn't published as an edict, but that's, that's a historical detail, the document, though, uh, and the policy was one of genuine freedom of religion. The, the text of that uh, edict makes it clear that that granted uh, freedom of, for all citizens of the Roman Empire to follow that form of religion or that understanding of God uh, that they felt was the true one. Uh, and a case can be made, and Robert and I have both tried to make the case, that that early policy was a reflection of the uh, 
early arguments of the uh, church fathers, such as Tertullian, uh, whom we mentioned earlier, and Lactantius, who uh, was a part of the court of Constantine uh, as early as uh, 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 the first decade uh, of the fourth century. Uh, that story can be told in a book that's conveniently located in the back. Uh, there's only 340 days until Christmas, so you know, now's your, now you don't have much time, so get over there. Well, I think that we are just about out of time, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? So, or should I take a few more questions? Tomorrow, okay, so the, some silly person out there in the Facebook world has asked me a question. Um, <laughs> It's, the question is, what are some of the greatest challenges facing prisoners in terms of mm. religious liberty? Mm. I do a, a lot question. of research in that area. Um, there, there are challenges, but um, the reality is that we've made a lot of progress with allowing religious freedom for inmates to attend religious services in institutions. If you want to visit a prison, you'll find religion there. Uh, you'll, you'll find worship services there. And unfortunately, we live in a time when a lot of uh, prisons have cut programs. And in some prisons, the only programs they have are religious. Um, so uh, we can at least be thankful for that. And I will say there was a court case before the Supreme Court just a few years ago where a Muslim inmate um, wanted to have a beard uh, but was not allowed to have a beard in Arkansas. So he sued the Department of Corrections. Um, for the opportunity to have religious freedom and have a half-inch beard. Uh, so the, the Department of Cor Corrections contended that it was a security risk. Uh, no telling what you can hide in that beard. Um, it's a half-inch in length. And so, uh, interestingly enough, that the Supreme Court decided the case nine to nothing in favor of the Muslim inmate, but used a lot of the research that we had conducted on Christians uh, to make the case that religion actually helped reduce recidivism and was a, a good um, that comes uh, to society. And um, so with that in mind, maybe we'll take one last question. And this one is from the members of the audience. It's, it's tagged for Dr. Shaw. Um, Many clergy from all walks of faith came to the aid of the black church, everyone from rabbis to Catholic priests, Episcopal preacher, preachers to black Baptist clergy. What was, what's that do to the biblical mandate alone? Your thoughts on the motivation? Although I think this probably would have gone to Jackie. Yeah, I would, but, I would ask. Um, I would ask Jackie, Rivers. do you want to take that? What was, was that due to the, the biblical mandate alone? Your thoughts on their motivation? Well, I think that biblical mandate was very powerful for a lot of the clergy who came, whether they were Jewish or Roman Catholic or Anglican. But I think we also have to recognize that a lot of people also came just out of that sense. You know, this, this, this idea that we have an innate sense of God's calling. A lot of people came out of their sense of what was right and wrong, not necessarily explicitly religious at all. Mm -hmm. So there was the two things were at work, which I see as both being very much a part of the right that's def uh, defended by the First Amendment, the, religious, the right to religious freedom, because there were college students who came from the North in particular uh, in response to the Civil Rights Movement who were not necessarily motivated by religion at all. So yes, I think the biblical mandate was a powerful force, but it wasn't the only thing at work. That innate sense of God's calling, I think that was at work too. Well, listen, uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Wilkins, and Dr. Rivers. Thank you. That concludes our evening. <laughs>